Gaza is homogeneous. It's a piece of land clearly defined with international borders. Not like the West Bank that never has had a recognized national border. And we thought that this can be a good beginning. So when we started Oslo, I suggested already to the Palestinians and Egyptians that they may have Gaza, even a small state. But they were afraid that uh, we are saying Gaza first and Gaza last. So to assure them that we don't mean just to give them back Gaza, but we are ready to give more, we included uh, Jericho on the West Bank, and we told them that we should follow in the West Bank as well. So we started with Gaza. And eventually the historic division in Israel was between the greater Israel and the divided Israel into two states, a Palestinian and an Israeli. Finally, Arik Sharon, with whom I worked, accepted the idea that there is no solution but to have a Palestinian state on the side of the state of Israel. Gaza was the first step to realize it. We took out our army, dismantled the settlements, we invested a lot of national efforts, money, and we handed them over a full piece of land to their control. And I worked with Eric very closely. Actually, I was then the foreign minister. I negotiated with Abu Allah about finding a solution to the whole uh, situation with the knowledge of Sharon. Sharon thought that I'm a little bit in a hurry. He wanted to do it slower. But between the two of us, we reached an agreement. I talked a great deal with uh, Arafat. And I told him that Gaza is the size of Singapore. Singapore has more people than Gaza does. And if he will organize it properly, he can be a beautiful place. And since then, uh, Arafat started to speak about Singapore. That was his uh, vision. And I thought he's right. Then come, came Hamas. And they are the ones that prevent the Palestinians today from having a Palestinian state. They are the ones who cause all the troubles to the Gazan people. What do they achieve? A propaganda victory. What is the worth of a propaganda victory if the children are hungry? So is unilateral withdrawal off the table? I don't know. If they will change the behavior, it may be again on the table. I mean, I don't believe that history has uh, permanent rules or simple solutions. What will you stand for? To continue the peacemaking. Today, I think we have to emphasize more the economic side than the strategic or diplomatic one, because I think since Second World War, all the important events were done by economic locomotives and not by military tanks. I knew that if uh, the disengagement went through, it would split the party into two, which is uh, exactly what happened. And I tried in every way to prevent it. That is by, uh, by persuasion, by postponement. Uh, at the end, nothing worked. The party did split into two. Uh, the disengagement went through. Explosives, uh, weapons, rockets flowed into, uh, into the Gaza uh, district. And from there, fired onto Israel, 600 rockets. Uh, and then this ignited, of course, the Hezbollah action in the north, uh, and the rest is history, not happy history either. So I think people are now reassessing the value of additional unilateral withdrawals, and I think that people understand that if you flee from terror, terror pursues you. Uh, there is a way to achieve peace and security, but unilaterally retreating in the face of terror is not one of them. So in fact, instead of bringing peace closer, it brought Hamas terror closer. It emboldened the terrorists on the one hand, and it gave them improved uh, bases from which to launch their rockets into our uh, towns and cities. And indeed, this is exactly what happened. Hamas not only did not stop the terror, but uh, allowed it to increase through their own factions and others. Uh, this, of course, is uh, intolerable. You, no country can sustain rocket attacks on its uh, towns and cities and uh, communities for very long. Uh, when we left Lebanon, this prompted the great uh, uh, 
feeling, a great sense of victory among the Hezbollah. Uh, Nasrallah made his famous cobweb speech. The Jews may have all these weapons, but their, uh, their will is flimsy like cobwebs. We have the superior Muslim will. With the force of arms, we can make the Jews retreat eventually from all of Palestine, read Israel. Uh, and this reverberated uh, to Hamas and prompted the Second Intifada. The Second Intifada prompted our withdrawal from Gaza. At least that's how the Palestinians saw it. And this in turn prompted the uh, aggressive action by Hezbollah and the kidnapping of two additional soldiers in the north. So this is a uh, uh, if you will, uh, uh, a hot iron ball that bounces from one side to the other. Retreat induces more terror, which induces more retreats, which induces more terror. I think the fundamental problem is that we face an enemy that is not fighting for this or that piece of territory. They're not fighting for Gaza and they're not fighting for Lebanon. They're fighting for Tel Aviv, for Haifa, for Jaffa. And every time uh, when, you, when you have such uh, an enemy, as opposed to uh, an adversary like Sadat, late President uh, Anwar Sadat of Egypt, or the late King Hussein of Jordan. These were leaders who wanted peace, who wanted coexistence. With them you can make deals. The deals hold because fundamentally they're willing to coexist at peace with you. But with Hamas and Hezbollah, the opposite happens. When you unilaterally give up something, it confirms their view that the march to Tel Aviv, the march to Jerusalem, the march to Haifa, uh, it's just a question of time, a question of time and a question of more terror. Terror works, it gets us out of one place, more terror will get us out of more places. That's the fundamental flaw uh, in the unilateral withdrawal schemes with these kinds of adversaries. Okay, we have money can, we can bring money so we can bring money for Okay, and we not want to get poor. Because God is the one that gives us. Okay, the safes okay, are in God's hand. Okay. Okay, they have clean hands and clean pockets, okay. بس أنا كمان في سؤال إنه يعني هلا السلطة اللي أنتوا سلطوها هي علمانية هي سلطة علمانية وأنتوا حركة دينية يعني بشكل أو بآخر حركة حركة دينية هلا كيف أنتوا هذا التضافر بدكوا أنتوا تحاولوا إنكم مثلاً تتعايشوا معه وتضافر تغيروا ما بعرف كيف أنتوا من إيش تصوركم شو الحمد أنت أخت مسلم كريم وتفهم حد فرض عليك تجيب سيارة نعم الحمد لله بالضبط أنا في بيتي عندي منام أنا ما فرضت عليه والله العظيم باختيارك إحنا بنقول له للآن نقول الشريعة أصل نوصلنا بثالث الثوابت ما رح نتنازل عن هذا الشيء لأنه رح تتحرر هذه البلاد نقول له أنا ما بقول لك اليوم وبكرة شهالية أو إحنا بنملك القوة اللي ندحرهم لكن أنا بقول حاجة يعني إنه يعني من 15 سنة إلى 20 سنة سيشاهد هو أن يرد العبرية Within uh, the Intifada, the last Intifada, the Israelis take uh, an strategic decision. Uh, uh, the, this decision uh, going with the vision that there is no Palestinian partner for negotiation and peace. At the beginning, they uh, deal with uh, Mr. Yasser Arafat as uh, a relevant uh, leader for the Palestinians. And after that, when they have uh, Mr. Abu, Baz Abu Mazen, as a peace uh, leader in Palestine, they uh, uh, trying to convince the international community and the Israeli people that he is personally is a good man, but he is so weak uh, leader. Then there is no partner in Palestine, uh, and they want to decide about uh, the Israeli and the Palestinian future alone. Yani, uh, the Palestinians. I hope that Mr. Abu Mazen will do much more than he did until now. But part of the Palestinians think, believe, that if the Israelis want to give chance to Abu Mazen, he can become much more strong. But the Israelis have no interest. It's useful for them to continue with these uh, traditions that we have uh, a weak leader in Palestine. He's a good, but he's weak. 
the withdrawal from Gaza, it's so clear that uh, every Israeli leader, all the prime ministers of Israel, they understand that they are staying in Gaza to have Gaza as part of the prize that they will give to the Palestinians to achieve uh, uh, agreement. They have nothing in Gaza, not by the historical meaning, not by the economic uh, meaning, and they, they have nothing in Gaza. Gaza is only a big, uh, big problem for any, uh, for any state. Then they uh, have the decision, the decision to withdraw, uh, withdraw unilateral from, uh, from Gaza as a part of a general plan that they will continue in the West Bank. Sharon himself decided to withdraw from, from Gaza. It's give impression to the Palestinians and to the Arab world that Israel understand only the language of uh, power. And they, uh, they are Harabu, Harabu. Harabu escape. They are escape uh, under the attacks of the Palestinian resistance. This is the conclusion. It's so difficult to convince any Palestinians that it's a result of uh, that we have uh, Mr. Abu Mazen as a president. side, focus shifted away from Gaza to the West Bank, a land of rolling hills, valleys, and a complex network of Israeli-controlled security zones and settlements winding around Palestinian-controlled villages. The controversial security barrier is 95% fence, and in built-up areas, 30-foot concrete slabs meant to stop sniper fire. Israel says it was built to prevent the daily threat of suicide bombers. Palestinians call it an illegal land grab and a human rights violation. Israel estimates the wall reduced terrorism by 95%. While most eyes were directed towards Gaza during the disengagement, remember that Sharon's plan also included the withdrawal from four settlements in the northern West Bank, such as Sanur, a settlement surrounded by Arab villages on all sides. This is the synagogue that we started to build a few months before. I am um, a real Jewish and patriot and I want to uh, keep my house. I don't have another house. This is my country. And nobody can take it from me. Sanur and three other West Bank settlements were removed from the Israeli map. Oh, 
תסתכלו על הערכים שלך הקטנים, אתה תהיה אשם בזה. אתה תהיה אשם, תנסה את המקום הזה. Such evacuation stirred security concerns. Flight time from Tel Aviv east to the West Bank, 18 kilometers. The settlement of Alfei Menashe rests just outside the West Bank, overlooking the Palestinian town of Kalkilia. This is the view from Alfei Menashe. One can see Tel Aviv and the wasteland communities of central Israel in plain view, 70% of Israel's population. Would disengagement continue here? February 1st, the Israeli outpost of Amona in the West Bank. Israel's Supreme Court ruled that nine houses were built illegally on Palestinian land and ordered them to be leveled. For thousands of young protesters, it invoked memories of Gush Katif. Armed with rocks and makeshift barriers, they formed human shields around the houses. Israeli security forces charged and trampled them with cavalry, wounding hundreds and arresting hundreds more. Nobody expected such violence. At stake for both sides in Amona was more than simply nine houses in the West Bank, but the future of disengagement. Can you imagine one morning you had a business and you had a home and you had a community and the next day you have nothing. It's not just losing your home, it's losing your past. You know, everything was destroyed. One of the great pleasures as an adult, an adult is that you can tell your child, come, I'll take you to my old schoolhouse. I'll show you my, the home I was born in. I'll show you the nursery school that I attended. Our children can't do that. Do you know there's a Yiddish expression, a shanda. A shanda is a disgrace. And I feel that this was something that's happened to me, it happened to all of our people. It's a sense of betrayal by the government that you were forcibly removed from your home. And that pain does not go away. When I go to sleep at night, I still see the soldiers coming near my house and surrounding my home and coming in and telling me I have to leave. Until today, my husband cries at night. Even I cry at night, remembering. I was once proud of the Israeli soldier. I'd see a soldier, I'd see a young girl dressed in the uniform of the IDF, and I would say, ah, Here's a, an Israeli soldier. Today, I say, I wonder if that young girl or that young man was one of the people who came to pull me out of my house. And if given the chance, this young girl would do it today to me. As soon as the disengagement took place, the expulsion of the Jews took place, the bombs began to fall. The bombs began falling all over the western Negev. A year later, there was war here. And Israel had to go in to Gaza. Israel had to go into Lebanon. The war began. The expulsion, the disengagement proved to the Arab world that we were just weak. That all you had to do is bomb the Jews a little bit and they would run. They had to make no commitments. They had to, they did not have to sign any peace agreement. And the end result, of course, was the creation of Hamistan. Hamas, one of the worst terrorist organizations, having taken over Gaza area. Two years later, not one family has a permanent home. Uh, where mostly it's scattered.
but the largest percentage, we have 450 families here in Nitsan. This is the largest uh, refugee camp. And it is a refugee camp, make no mistake. Even though you may look at my house at the moment and you say, hey, this looks pretty good, you know? It's made of cardboard. We want to go back home. Maybe that's why nothing is happening with the rebuilding of Gush Katif and other places. We're supposed to go home. And I speak to many people, and many people just say to me, let them open the door and we'll leave in a minute. We'll take our tents and we will go and settle the land again. We loved Gush Katif. There was no reason to have taken us out. We were there for a purpose, and our purpose is the same today. Gaza is part of Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. And just because the world has declared Gaza an Arab area does not mean it is so. Gaza is part of our historical homeland. Jews have always lived in the Gaza area and we expect to go back. The Arabs want to stay and live with us peacefully. Fine, let them stay. But we have a right to go back to our land. The Orange Gallery was started about a year and a half ago when we decided to bring all the work of our artists and artisans to the public. We had no building and uh, so we just collected all the stuff and went from house to house and to community centers and synagogues and we uh, went and brought our stuff to the people. And here's a sign for the Orange Gallery. I'm so proud of it. Look at it. Isn't it gorgeous? Our color of our fight for Gush Katif, to save Gush Katif, was orange. You can see the Magen David and its destruction. So this is, these, are all, um, these are all projects from uh, former Gush Katif uh, residents. Exactly. And, and will you accept artwork from any no. other Gush Katif, no. or other people not from Gush Katif? No, we if are. If I have an artist in Tel Aviv that I know, can, I, can they sell their art here? Not really, no. No, this is for Gush Katif artists and artisans. The Tel Aviv artist can sell his work in Tel Aviv, thank you. Uh, you can see these beautiful, beautiful trays. Oh, this is beautiful, look at this. Look at this, oh, this is gonna be, oh, this is really stunning. Oh my gosh, look at that, wow. This is lovely because this reminds us of Gush Katif, our White House with the red roof and the palm trees and the sand and the sun. And we chose the word orange gallery to remember our fight. The fight continues. Fight for our home, hopefully our return to Gush Katif in Gaza, where we actually belong. Return home. Many people feel that so much have been, was taken from them that they only need to get, which I might agree with or not, but that's a government thing, it's not my thing. We're here to help people that want to help themselves. We have 600 people listed in a website that got, got a job through our website, another 100 businesses that we help to, to uh, reopen or, or uh, entrepreneurs that we funded and helped and, and followed up with. Zecharia was a construction guy in uh, Gush Katif, very successful. And he had tremendous problems. He lost his business, lost his car, and lost a lot of stuff. He has amazing hands. There's an opportunity to really get him back to business. And they want normalcy. They don't want to be millionaires. They just want a normal house, normal living, normal families, which they lost in the past two years. You can imagine. 60 year olds literally crying to uh, 30 and 40 year olds 
that they lost their entire dignity. She, she tells me I have no reason to put clothing on in the morning. And, and it killed us. And it killed us. Shalom, Mishpachat Fitusi. אני אישה שכל החיים שלי עבדתי בגוש, אני לימדתי, נתתי חוגי בישול, היה לי קטרינג גדול בבית, והיינו חיים. באנו לכאן שנתיים בבית, וכתוצאה מכך אני הייתי במצב של חולת נפש, דיכאון עם כדורים וכדורי שינה, והיינו במצב מאוד מאוד... ממש לא טוב. והיום, ברוך השם, יש לי לאן לקום, לקום ולהתלבש ולהכין. ברוך השם, נשמחה, בריאה. ברוך השם. אני מגדל פה פלפלים בחממות. הכל אורגני פה. ובעזרת השם הולכים להיות פה הרבה מאוד פלפלים. תוך שלושה חודשים יהיו פה פירות של פלפלים, ממש. הכל הולך לאירופה, לא, לא לארץ. עוד שנה זה יהיה בגובה של שלוש מטר. פלפל זה הולך טוב פה, זה מקום טוב לפלפל. מדי פעם יש לנו לחץ, אנחנו לוקחים, לוקחים בדואים שיעזרו לנו. הם לא עובדים פה כל יום. רק היום. הם הגיעו אחרי הצהריים משלוש עד שמונה בלילה והולכים הביתה. פה הולכים להקים יישוב חדש שקוראים לו נווה. נווה? זה השם, כן. הוא הולך להיות מוקם שם באזור, ממש קרוב. אפשר לראות טרקטורים שעובדים שם ויש שם כבישים כבר. ואנחנו הולכים לגור שם עוד שנה בערך, בעזרת השם נעבור לפה ונעבוד פה. אבל זה לא דוגמה טובה, כי זה טוב מדי פה. רוב האנשים לא הצליחו ישר לבנות uh, מחדש את הבתים שלהם ולבנות uh, חממות, הרבה לא עשו את זה, הרבה לא הצליחו בגלל כל מיני בעיות. פה זה המצב הכי טוב שיש. אתה אוהב לעבוד פה? כן. למה? כן. למה? זה ציונות, זה למה. אתה מפריח את השממה, פה ממש... לא שתלו פה שום דבר לפני זה, כלום לא היה פה לפני זה. לא, לא עצים, לא דשא, לא כלום. פעם ראשונה ששתלו פה משהו מאז שנברא העולם בערך, זה אנחנו. Uh, four years ago See, with lots of love and hugging <laughs> now we have uh, olives and look this it's kind of palm this tree was also small very small and it's getting bigger and bigger all the time every house in the kibbutz uh, there is a room like this if there is a missiles you know uh, katyushas and Kassams, then we go inside 30 centimeters of uh, cement. My wife, she's a, she a painter. Uh, we hope that uh, it, it uh, will guard us. I have here lemons and um, clementines and almonds and how they call it? Wine, not wine, uh, grapes. How close are we now from Gaza? Um, 800 meters. My friend asked me, <coughs> why you live in the kibbutz? And I take, him, take them here to this particular place. You can hear the, the wind and the birds. And it's so peaceful. Do you, do you ever think about it? Do you ever get nervous being in, in your backyard in this place? I mean, never, never. It's so, it's so quiet and you forget, you know. You can see if I open it's very very thick and uh, there is metal uh, uh, 
plates against bullets. Everything is bulletproof, I hope. So where are we now? Now, we are uh, at the end of the kibbutz. We are near the fences. From here to Gaza Strip, 800 meters. Uh, here, it's all, all fence here. And uh, behind that, there is a um, new, new fence. Uh, last year, they, they put it here, and it's an um, electric fence. If, if somebody touch it, I have beeper, and it starts to beep. When they asked me if I want the fence, I said no. Because it looks like an army camp or, or something. That's why we have so many trees and we live in the trees and we don't see the we don't see Gaza you can't tell that we are next to Gaza you know one kilometer from Gaza so you do that on purpose yes sure and it's like bubble inside you don't if I don't tell them they don't know that we have yeah. the army here and everything and jeeps and tanks here in the kibbutz they don't know because they don't see it only if I tell them ago there was one Kassam here and one curve died. 400 liter of uh, blood give one liter of milk. A cow give milk only after uh, giving birth so the cow should be pregnant all the time otherwise you lost money. I wish uh, the camera could capture the smell here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing we're missing. You see how big they are? The soldier had patrol from here to the refe, to the cow shed. And uh, if there is a bad situation, so the soldiers go inside here and they have um, the, their jackets. No, against the uh, bullets, they have to wear it. This is uh, block number seven. Uh, each each uh, soldier he knows where he should go, and uh, and also here olives, you know, a piece. Olives, it's a peace, it's so, you know, here it's all even here, war, war and peace together. <laughs> I'm Adrian Bashik, I'm co-director of Disengagement. And I'm uh, Jaron Galinsky, the other co-director of Disengagement. Uh, we come from a different background. Um, we both grew up in Miami, and I became a journalist with ABC and then CNN, and then left to create this independent documentary covering Israel's disengagement through the war with Lebanon. And uh, I started off doing uh, documentaries locally in Miami, and uh, we sort of got together and decided that this was a worthy project um, of a very monumental historical event. It felt uh, we felt like it needed to be covered. So there were 5,000 journalists covering uh, this this event, and I would say an estimated 
uh, 50 to 100 documentaries came out of this one event that ended up going all over the world. So there have been many different perspectives on this one singular event, and our perspective, I believe, is unique. Uh, right, because the one common thread among all those documentaries was that they were covering people's individual stories or a certain angle uh, of the settler movement or the, the IDF forces going in. Uh, none that we met and that we worked alongside covered it objectively, covered it uh, a year long after the pullout to see what Gaza was like, uh, and covered it from the Palestinian angle. Uh, we tried to do as much justice as could be done there. So the question is, how do we get access to our characters? Uh, we had direct interviews with Benjamin Netanyahu, Shimon Peres. Uh, former Fatah officials, Hamas candidates, settlers who removed uh, people, uh, soldiers from the army. Um, number one rule in journalism and filmmaking, you're as good as, as your access points are. So we had producers in Gaza on the Palestinian side working with the BBC who lined up interviews there. Uh, and we had journalists in Israel who also helped to line up interviews with Benjamin Netanyahu, for example, and Shimon Peres. We talk about access going into Gaza, going into even the settlements during and leading up to the pullout was a dangerous mission, let's call it. Uh, you know, this isn't local news, this isn't coverage here in the U.S. It is a precarious situation. Israelis, Palestinians, Israelis versus Israelis leading up to the disengagement. We had to navigate the waters of this whole anti-disengagement movement of the orange on the right. They were trying to sneak into Gush Katif. So Gaza was a, was a closed military zone. And as journalists, we were some of the only people who could go in. But then there were fears of, of, of disputes and violence between settlers and the IDF leading up to the pullout, of which there was. I mean, Jaron was caught uh, amidst rock throwing and, and, yeah. and pushing and shoving, uh, you know. Yeah, that, was, that was probably the worst of it. Um, rocks, paint canisters, uh, eggs. Uh, uh, but I, I would say that uh, the rock throwing was probably the, the most dangerous um, thing that happened in the disengagement. It was actually very remarkable. I thought the most, one of the most remarkable things about the disengagement was that there were no deaths, um, that the soldiers didn't uh, use too much force on a settler, and a settler didn't use too much force on a soldier. There were a lot of serious injuries, and uh, obviously there were a lot of emotional injuries on both sides, and it's gonna be interesting actually to see years down the road what the soldiers and settlers uh, are affected with. Um, we met with this, an army psychologist who mentioned that uh, both sides are affected by post-traumatic stress syndrome from Yamit uh, in 1982, and this evacuation seemed to have even more emotional weight than, than Yamit, or at, at least in my perspective. <laughs> History. We, we devote a lot of uh, our film to giving the viewer a condensed uh, in, a picture and timeline of the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from 1948 through the disengagement. Uh, we thought it was vitally important because our generation uh, maybe catches a headline here and there from Israel or from Gaza or from the West Bank. Uh, but rarely is there a piece of filmmaking that really encapsulates everything in a short, uh, punchy manner that, that can get the point across. Yeah, and I, I really thought, uh, both Adrian and I thought going into this, uh, we were looking for that one character that can lead us through the entire history of the process. And we found that character with Ariel Sharon. He um, was uh, fought in the 1948 War of Independence and then we have footage of him fighting. Yeah, we have that. We managed to get great uh, stock footage. Eighteen thousand dollars in stock footage. <laughs> Was it that much? <laughs> yeah. Well, way too much money spent on stock footage. Uh, but we we got great support from the uh, IDF archive as well as uh, Channel One in Israel, uh, Palestinian TV, um, and AP as well. And a couple of freelance shooters that were present at memorable events like Sharon addressing the settlers in two thousand one during his campaign in Netzer one of the settlements in Gush Katif, 
promising them that you are the heart and soul of Israel, you are the state of Israel, and then making that 180 degree turn two years later and announcing disengagement. That yeah. was the most surprising thing of yeah. all, and, and really the niche of our story. Yeah, and Sharon really was was that character that could lead us through Israeli history from the very beginning to the very end uh, when he fell into the coma. But he he's still also, in a coma today. Still in the coma. Still in a coma. Um, but it, you know, he he was the disengagement because he built the settlements, and I think this is where our documentary is yeah. uh, unique: is that we realized the importance of Sharon to the story. Not only did he build the, the settlements, but he destroyed them. He was the one that singularly made this decision, went against the Likud, went against his politics from just a year before and we have that footage from 2001 when he's in the settlement saying that mm -hmm. you are the the backbone of the the, the Jewish nation we open people, we open with it and then we bring it full circle and, and put it in context to show exactly where in time that that happened right and then, and then Sharon of course uh, is is uh, he basically stabbed the the we settler could. movement in the back and they felt you know so violated and many of them today even feel, uh, you know, that they've been uh, completely disenfranchised. That uh, these people do, don't want to join the army anymore. A lot of them, they don't, they can't put on the uniform. There's one great, you know, poignant soundbite when they say, uh, a settler says, "You're dirtying, you're dir dirtying the uniform." Yeah. Uh, His this, son won't won't join the ranks. <laughs> Objectivity. Uh, it was very important to us to be objective in this film. Uh, sure, we have a headlining character and a settler, Rachel Saberstein, but that, that's because she was, uh, she was affected. Uh, this was an Israeli story. We, we, we show both sides and we even extend the story into Lebanon to show how the disengagement uh, possibly influenced events creating the war with Lebanon the following summer. But we do a, 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 we worked very hard at being objective between all parties involved. Because it was an, Isra an intern Israeli story first, meaning the left versus the right, the orange versus the blue, and the IDF somewhere in between. We covered all those angles. Then how the disengagement affected Palestinians moving forward. And then in the end, how that disengagement, as we said, affected the war with Lebanon a year later. So we really included all, all angles. Yeah, and uh, I thought that the, the, another great thing about this film and, and something that I'm proud of in particular is uh, the access we got to the Palestinians once the disengagement finished. Uh, we got access to uh, Gaza after the pullout and saw um, Hamas training camps, uh, Al Aqsa University, um, the, the lack, the lack of, the lack of uh, any development. development. And uh, you know, the, to me, it was that was the most tragic story of all. Is that there was the, uh, you know this billion dollar in, a year industry in these greenhouses that were basically given to the Palestinian people. Um, and uh, because of the lack of order and chaos that erupted uh, as soon as the disengagement f finished, um, this food uh, and this money is gone. And, uh, and, and, and that was a, a really important aspect that we touched upon throughout. We, we, we opened with it even. We, we, right after uh, previewing Rachel, we go to the farms and we show how what was so... Uh, what was at the at the very root of Gush Katif of the Gaza settlements were these these farming communities, and we then follow that story throughout the film and end one year later. You see that the hot houses are not being farmed. Um, a gentleman in the Mwasi Arab community says that he knows of one person who was operating any farming out of the former settlements. Uh, I think one person from uh, our greenhouses are operating now. The reason I strive for objectivity, and I think we strive towards this in our film, is that I think peace will only come once everybody in the world looks at the conflict with a, a, a sensitivity towards all sides and towards all perspectives and towards uh, all the, the opinions. And 
we tried to present these in the movie so that you, the viewers, can understand all sides and form your own opinion about who's right, who's wrong, and really there are no, there are no, there is no right and wrong. Right. There's just, sure. uh, you know, there, there is a, a, this conflict, this eternal conflict over this, this piece of land in the Middle East, and both sides are right. Both sides deserve to be there, but politics and religion and um, radicalism, unfortunately, are getting in the way in the Middle East. Spirituality. We made an effort to cover the spiritual nature of what the disengagement meant, not just to religious Jews, but to secular Jews, and also to uh, as, uh, Muslim Palestinians. I mean, we're there at prayer services with Mahmoud Abbas, praying to Allah, thanking them for the gift of the land back in their hands. The same as on the Jewish side, they were mourning the loss of the land. Um, we can't underestimate, you know, uh, most broadcast networks and even newspapers do a good job of, we think, sometimes ignoring uh, the spiritual motivations behind some of these headlines. And it was so apparent, it was such a palpable movement among the Orange, the religious Jewish movement in Israel, protesting against the disengagement, um, that you could not cover it. And we had prayers translated to, to show you exactly what they were saying and how much it really meant to them. Um, and we even had evangelical Christians in the film from Missouri, from the south, who had traveled all the way to Israel to protest the action because they believed that it was against biblical prophecy. Hashem said, In thy land shall be married, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And these are forces at work in our world that people believe in these theologies, and it was too hard not to cover. Yeah, and, and the, it was interesting because the, the, the party and the faction that benefited the most from the disengagement was Hamas, which is a religious, mm -hmm. fundamentalist Muslim mm -hmm. movement. And uh, they took all the credit for the disengagement in, in, in Gaza and therefore... Attributing it to uh, their resistance movement empowered by God. Correct. And, uh, you know, this is what Bibi Netanyahu says in his interviews, that the disengagement emboldened the terrorists. And that's what Rachel was saying as well. And it proved to be true. Well, uh, uh, it did. <laughs> there as filmmakers, I think we, we, we do kind of differ because maybe in the short term that's right. true. And, in the short and, term. And, and our film yeah. kind of arrives to that conclusion. Yeah. In the long term, who knows? Right. Uh, and we, we do give that uh, perspective also. Absolutely. You know, Renan Gissen says in, in the interview that the, f the future of a Jewish Gaza is, is basically inconceivable due to demographics. You had 9,000 Jews surrounded by a million and a half Arabs who are reproducing at much faster rates. And therefore, the Jewish uh, colony experiment that Sharon initiated mm -hmm. was, in his eyes, a failure. And I guess Sharon came to that realization as well, and just before he fell into the coma, decided to go through with the, the disengagement. Hamas uh, reaped the political wards of this, of, this, of this move by Israel. So mm -hmm. it's, to me, uh, what I want to know, actually, is whether or not Israel actually planned that and whether Israel knew and Sharon knew that Hamas would yeah. take over and thought this actually falls into their long-term plan. That was always our question to any of these top officials six months after the disengagement. We would ask that question and people were very scared to touch it. I guess it went uh, with Sharon into, the, uh, into his coma. I yeah. guess the answer we'll, we'll never really know. At the very halfway point of the film, because we kind of produced it in two, in two parts, before disengagement, during, and then after following disengagement. And right there, I mean, at the, at the critical apex of the film, uh, Jaron was, was shooting inside the Nevit Kalim synagogue, and he filmed the final removal of the Torah. And the last settler and the rabbis, they bring down off the altar. Is, it, is that an altar? Uh, yeah, you could say okay. that. Um, he was filming that. It's a bima. It's, it's a, a bima. bima. Yeah, I don't know the, the, the Jewish terminology. Okay. So he was filming that on the last night that they were removing settlers. 
Um, and exactly a month later, I was in that same spot filming that FEMA with an emptied synagogue and newly, uh, newly moved in Palestinians destroying that synagogue. Uh, if they're destroying it, it's neither here nor there. It just it was this sweeping shot that I, I put the camera on a tripod and did a 360 degree shot. And you can see what it really meant to both sides for the Israelis, the destruction for Palestinians, the vindication, if you will. the most memorable part was uh, was just for me uh, probably the most emotional part as well was just seeing uh, Rachel Saperstein getting pulled out of her house and uh, and you know I, I had been living there essentially for the last couple you know weeks e even though I, I could understand the, the, the policy implications for the disengagement and I could understand uh, the move uh, just to see any human getting pulled out of their house that mm -hmm. they build, mm -hmm. built and that they loved and that they you know planned on living in for the next two generations just to yeah. see that on, that on a human level you on a human level the fact that they did also have this religious attachment to the land made it so much more traumatic for them because it kind of you know it went away from their theology it did, it didn't mm -hmm. just it wasn't just taking away their house it was like sort of a, a, a destruction of what they believed in. And they still, to this day, actually believe that they're gonna go back. I spoke to Rachel um, a couple weeks ago and she believes that, and it's now two years after the disengagement, she believes that she will return to that house. Jaron Galinsky. We hope you enjoyed this engagement.